Day Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today I have a guest who's been on the show before. His name is Dr. Jed Fahey, but today he's accompanied by Lisa Curtis, and they're going to talk about the benefits of Moringa, something I know absolutely nothing about, so I'm excited to learn. Please welcome them both to the show. It's nice to see you again, Dr. Fahey, and nice to meet you, Lisa. Nice to meet you, too. Thanks for having us. Yeah, so this will be interesting because I love I love the show because I always learn at least one new thing every day. And so I have I know I'm guessing it's some kind of a supplement or an herb. So I can't wait to hear what it is, why you guys are so interested in it and how it could help our viewers. Oh, we, we got her dead to rights. She's going to learn something today. <laughs> I promise five new things, at least five. <laughs> All right. Well, hopefully it tastes good, though, because, you know, you know, because I, I don't want to, you know, bash anyone's product, but people often send me things to try. And, you know, on the air, I don't want to be disrespectful, but I've tried Amla and I just I just do not like it. I just don't like the taste. I've tried it in things, you know, to try to I just didn't like it. So first question for me is how does it taste? Moringa tastes kind of like matcha. So it has kind of an earthy flavor. Um, but similar to matcha, you can use it in a lot of different ways. So a lot of folks use it in smoothies. You can also make a latte with it. We have bars and other products, blends that we make with it. Um, but it, I, I think the, the earthy sort of green flavor is pretty easy to mask if that's not your jam. I, I don't mind the taste of matcha, but I'm curious, does Moringa have caffeine? So it's caffeine free, um, but it does have a lot of B vitamins and a lot of other nutrients. So a lot of folks say that it gives them energy without caffeine. Nice. Well, I'm curious to know why you guys are so interested in it. Yeah. Well, let me pull up a few just background slides um, and I will kind of introduce myself and then I'll, I'll hand the stage over to Jed. Uh, so what we want to talk about today is just, you know, the benefits of this superfood Moringa and a little bit about separating fact from fiction. Because if you, you know, look online, there's a lot of things that people say, they call it the miracle tree. And Jed's here to talk about, you know, what is actually true? What is, uh, you know, what's got science behind it? So, um, Quick background on me, uh, like you, Chef AJ, I knew nothing about Moringa 10 years ago um, when I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Niger, West Africa. So I was in a very rural village, no electricity, no running water, not a lot of healthy food. And as a vegetarian, I felt like I wasn't getting enough nutrients in my diet. It was just eating basically rice every day and it left me feeling really weak and really tired. So I asked some women in my village, you know, what can I eat that will make me feel more energized? And they literally pulled these leaves off a tree. You can see the leaves in my hand and, you know, leaves in my background. Love these Moringa leaves um, and mixed them into a snack called Cooley Cooley. So I started eating it. It made me feel so much better. I did some research. I was like, this plant is incredible. How do I get it to more people? Um, and the thing that the women I was working with in West Africa really wanted was a way to sell it in the U.S. So that's how I started Cooly Cooly. And I'll hand it over to Jen to introduce himself. Um, I, I was on the show, I just checked before airtime. I was on the show uh, two years ago, a little over two years ago, talking about phytochemicals uh, or phytonutrients or bioactives. Um, I had a great time with Chef AJ. Um, I'm a, I'm a, I got my doctorate in, in nutritional biochemistry. Um, I have uh, a background in phytochemistry, the chemicals of plants, which are the minor things in terms of the quantity or volume. Um, in other words, they're not carbohydrates, proteins, fats, or um, uh, or fiber, um, but they have great bioactive potential um, in the human body. Um, and so we talked all about that a couple of years ago. I spent uh, over a quarter century uh, as a faculty member at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and the School of Public Health. Um, and I started getting interested in Moringa in association with my phytochemistry work and my human health work, um, yeah, 25 years ago. Um, and I met Lisa uh, 10 or so years ago, right, Lisa? Yeah. Um, when she called me, she'd started her company and she called me for a little help with... Um, actually getting 
as I recall, it was getting into Whole Foods and getting the appropriate stuff on the certificate of analysis and so on and so forth. And I've been advising her company uh, when she needs me since then and really enjoying it and enjoying eating Moringa. So um, we'll uh, we'll talk about that uh, at some length. And yeah. Uh, what do we have next, Lisa? Yeah. So I think we're Let's just kind of quick it. overview. You know, I think there's a lot of folks like Chef AJ who've never heard about Moringa. We'll talk about what it is, talk about some of the claims around it, what the science says, how to judge Moringa quality, and then how to use it. Um, so what is Moringa? I'll give the quick overview and then let Jed go into the science. Um, like I said, tastes kind of like matcha. It has, it's uh, the leaves of this Moringa tree known as the tree of life used all over the world. So it's used in India and in Ayurvedic medicine. It's used all over Africa where it's called the miracle tree. It's used in the Philippines where it's the national vegetable. Um, one of the most nutritious plants on the planet has some incredible scientific benefits, anti-inflammatory, regulating blood sugar, and boosting energy in a caffeine-free way, um, which I'll let Jed talk a little bit more. Um, and, you know, it's been featured in a lot of research papers, if you want to speak to that, Jed. Um, sure, yeah. So uh, this slide that we have up here is uh, obviously not very information-filled, but it shows you that until about the year 2000, so until about the time that I got interested in it, um, there was not a lot of activity in the peer-reviewed scientific literature on it. And now, uh, as you can see, the interest has exploded. Uh, next, please. Um, so comparison to matcha is pretty apt. Um, you know, in stores, it's actually in many places starting to outsell matcha in the supplement category. And um, does make great for a smoothie, also great for a latte. Um, and just touching on kind of key trends, it is a complete plant protein, um, has all your essential amino acids. It is a superfood, has a lot of medicinal benefits, um, and has a lot of really great functions as well. Um, so, you know, we find uh, when we look at our consumers and why they eat it, it's, it's really about um, energy, but there's a whole other list of health concerns that Moringa can also help address. Um, so just kind of some of the quotes from what we find people say is that they add it to smoothies, their energy never drops, um, they give them great energy. Um, and, you know, we, I'm a mom, so I love this one too, is it, you know, it's a green, super nutritious green powder that you can add into things like mac and cheese and, um, you know, Gives, gives a little bit of greens in, in maybe the less nutritious kid dishes. So I'll let Jed take it from here. Yeah, so, um, so Lisa, I, uh, Lisa mentioned the word superfood and I, and I have to just, I wanna dwell on that for a minute. And also something that Chef AJ said, you said, is it a, you know, is it a, you assume it's a supplement. It is sold as a supplement and Lisa, you, I'm not sure if you even se sell it as a supplement at the moment, but labeled as food actually for us. Pri primarily we think of it. Yeah. As a, as a food. Um, and in fact, since you've got this display of products behind you, Lisa, this is not a commercial message, but you, you well, it is, I suppose, but you can see that everything behind Lisa is either the pa a powder or um, or something moringa mixed with something else, so it it is most certainly a food. And and you heard Lisa talk about the way it it she uh, it grabbed her attention in in West Africa. Um, it 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 is it can be used as a primary food food source. The fresh leaves, that is. Um, we should point out that. You know, it is a tree, it grows very quickly. And what we're talking about using is the leaves of this tree. Um, so it is, it can be used as a primary food source or a dietary replacement for some other things. It is used uh, in various parts of the world as a famine food when nothing else is available because it tends to stay available and on the trees since it's not a sort of ephemeral crop like, like broccoli or lettuce that once you have a, once the soil dries out, it goes away like that. Um, and it's also been used as um, not as a supplement, but in nutritional supplementation, where uh, people with acute malnutrition, protein energy malnutrition, 
stunting, wasting, failure to thrive in infants and children um, can uh, get a significant uh, pickup, a nutritional pickup from adding some Moringa to their diets. Um, and, you know, we can talk about that. We have some other slides talking about some of the other ways in which it's very useful. But I do want to go back to the this this word superfood. Um, when Lisa and I first met, she was using the word superfood. I had dissed a number of people for using that word. Lisa was so nice. I didn't feel like getting in her face about the term. And <laughs> because, but as a scientist, I didn't like it very much. Um, but I've come to realize, thanks to my conversations with Lisa and many, many other people over the years, you know, if the consumer, um, if the customer, and we're talking about American customers here, wants to call something a superfood, you know, I don't really care. I, I won't say that it's any better than some of the other things that are called superfoods, but it's totally different. Um, I mean, they're all totally different from each other. So it's super in the sense that it does all the things we've just talked about, right? Um, it's, it's nutritional profile comparable to egg and milk protein is, is phenomenally good. Um, there are other poor sources of protein that are, that are more popular than, than Moringa, but so let's call it a superfood. And Lisa, across the, the continent, um, a, a handshake of peace. Um, we, we do agree that we can call it a superfood. Um, so in terms of its functional medicine use, uh, uses, um, most of the organs of the plant, meaning the leaves, which we're talking about, the stems, the roots, the bark, um, and the seeds in particular, have been described and reported to have medicinal properties. Um, and we have listed a few of them there. I, I would, and, and you will remember that slide we showed showing the just uh, exponential increase in peer-reviewed scientific articles what we will see and what we're seeing in the past 10 years is that many of the 300 plus folk remedy claims of uh, efficacy of Moringa against things, many of the, some of the things you see listed here, won't stand the test of Western science, you know, it's hard scrutiny. Um, but on the other hand, there are a, quite a number of them that have. So in addition to its food properties, it has a number of, let's call them medicinal properties, um, which we'll we'll talk a little bit more about if you'd like. Next. A lot of these properties are due to a compound called um, uh, moringan or glucomoringan. You see them on this slide here. It's a similar, fam a similar group of compounds to what's found in cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, which I spent uh, most of my career studying, um, and Moringa is one of the few non-cruciferous family plants that happens to have this um, these glucosinolates. The compounds on the left are glucosinolates, and they get acted upon by an enzyme that is also in the plant leaves and in your gut microflora, the bacteria in your gut, and converted into the compound on the right, which is very biologically active um, in, in, in mammals in a, in a positive way. It induces or upregulates the, uh, the body's natural detoxification and, and um, antioxidant mechanisms. So, you know, I told you 20 years ago, I got interested in Moringa or more than that. And it was because of this compound that we knew was present in Moringa. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I thought that was what the science says. Well, so I told you some of the things on this slide. Um, among other things, the this compound, this isothiocyanate, it's called, or moringan, it's the name of the compound, is every bit as potent as um, some of the compounds from broccoli um, against Helicobacter pylori, which is a causative agent of, of uh, ulcers, which infects something like 50% of the world's population, not so high in the United States. But um, uh, so as I mentioned, there are a lot of medicinal claims. One does have to be careful when one surfs the internet um, because there are 
already a lot of unscrupulous profiteers who are making claims that don't hold up, um, which is one of the reasons that, you know, we Cooley Cooley is, is, is selling it and, and uh, sourcing it and selling it as a food, but, but, you can't talk to someone like me and ignore the fact that there are um, there are beneficial medicinal properties over and above its nutritional properties. Next slide, please. So we we won't go through. Could you back up to that list? We won't go through all of these, and and in fact, maybe best if we skip them and come back to them later. But you can see a list here of the uh, in which we sort of recounted the scientific evidence on a number of points. We talked about nutritional value. It's a little hard to see, but anti-inflammatory and oxidant po antioxidant potency, antibiotic properties, selective antibiotic properties, for example, against helicobacter, which infects the stomach. Anti-diabetic in indications are very strong. Um, and there's quite a good bit of clinical evidence on that now. Chemoprotective potential, this is cancer prevention. Evidence is not so strong, but it's it's certainly there. Um, Antihypertensive activity, again, this is a this is a potential area of a lot of interest. Um, Anti-asthmatic potential, um, and then some others, including you'll see antiviral. Um, there is activity of this class of compounds against. SARS-CoV-2, the, the virus which caused, causes COVID. Um, has it been, has Moringa been subject to a clinical study with people with COVID? No, not that I'm aware of, or not yet, but it probably will be. So a lot of potential here um, that has intrigued me for many years. Okay, now, now the next slide, please. Um, this this is a slide just, just Look at giving what what I regard as is a pretty pretty dramatic this in the next slide anyway a pretty dramatic indication of how a small amount of moringa ten grams per day which Lisa what's that two one tablespoon of dried leaves or two two probably yeah I think it's about two um given to uh, uh 110 malnourished children given over a course of something like eight weeks. And what the, these are severely malnourished um, children um, in Burkina Faso. Um, half of them got Moringa, half of them got the normal porridge that would be used. They were in rehabilitation clinics. Um, that's how they were enrolled. Um, and frequency of diarrhea was monitored, which is sort of the, the, the bellwether uh, in, in these cases height and weight and and some other parameters uh, of, of of undernutrition. Uh, and the next slide, I think we show their results. This is not my study. Um, yeah, so there was quicker quicker recovery with Moringa, greater improvement in wasting and underweight metrics. Average daily weight gain you can see was, um, you know, what, 30, 40% higher, 50% higher with Moringa than the standard porridge. Uh, average length of care at an inpatient rehab unit, 36 days versus 57 days with the, the placebo or the standard porridge. Um, neither of them are acceptable, but, but um, it's still a dramatic improvement. And then on the bottom line, um, and, and this is what was so striking to me when I read this study, is a profound change in the frequency of diarrhea, 8% with Moringa and 80% in the standard porridge. Um, next. I don't know, yeah, okay, we, we can go through some, some more examples. I promise you this won't be three hours of hardcore science, but um, one of the things that, that we were interested in when I was uh, when I had my lab at, at Johns Hopkins is um, well, you know what are what is the uh, antioxidant potential, um, the anti-inflammatory activity, etc. Um, if you make a tea out of moringa, and we, we we decided to look for reasons that get a little bit in the in the weeds, um, we decided to look at hot traditionally steeped tea 
um, and cold brewed tea, um, sort of sun tea, if you will. The reason for that is the hot tea destroys that enzyme I told you about, myrosinase, which which converts the inactive form of the of the phytochemical to the active form. Um, and uh, the cold tea we thought would not destroy that enzyme, I mean, it doesn't. So you're delivering a slightly different potpourri or blend of phytochemicals. Um, and we looked at taste and palatability first off. And uh, ne next slide, please. Yeah, we talked about this reaction, as I just said, the hot tea destroys that enzyme. Next. Um, so for example, we looked at antioxidant, um, uh, uh, anti-inflammatory activity. This was not in a clinical trial. This was in uh, test tube, if you will, Petri plate tests that are very standardized for nitric oxide production. It's a marker of inflammation. And you can see on the, on the right, the hot tea um, had what winds up being a very low, in this, in this test, high on the scale is, is low anti-inflammatory low anti activity. So the hot tea had low anti-inflammatory activity on the far right because um, we had gotten rid of this enzyme. But the cold tea um, or pure moringan, the compound itself, or on the far left, SF is sulforaphane from broccoli sprouts, all had really potent anti-inflammatory activity. Next. Antibiotic properties. We talked, I mentioned Helicobacter pylori. Next, please. It, it colonizes the stomach. Um, and uh, interestingly, we find that um, with this compound from Moringa, same thing happens with broccoli, which we've actually spent more time researching. Um, but uh, it has direct antibiotic activity. I'm sorry, my pointer won't work here on these slides. But on the far left, you see it's direct antibiotic activity against Helicobacter um, itself, you know, in a test tube. It also inhibits the key enzyme that Helicobacter uses to gain a foothold in the stomach. That's the middle bottom arrow. And then it's got activity against Helicobacter once it's in the stomach. Um, and finally, um, because of some of the systemic activity it has, meaning um, inducing protective enzymes throughout the body, it actually reduces gastric tumor formation in a mouse model. That's the upper right. Um, so it's really a multimodal um, antibiotic, um, a selective antibiotic. Next, please. Um, this just compares, again, low on this scale is good or lower is better, I should say. Compares Moringa on the far right with broccoli sprouts and some other cruciferous vegetables in terms of its direct antibiotic potency against uh, Helicobacter. Next. I should just pause and say to Chef AJ and, and her listeners, we can provide any of these scientific papers that you'd like, of course. Um, so just be in touch with, with the chef um, and we'll get them to you. Um, yeah, anti-diabetic activity. This is something where there is a tremendous amount of traditional medicine use. Um, when I was at a Moringa conference in Ghana back, I don't know, 10 or 12 13 years ago, I spoke with a number of, of physicians um, who uh, were able to, by putting, by giving, prescribing moringa leaf, either fresh or dried, to their diabetic patients, were able to get them um, in a much better place, get them off metformin, which was the primary drug that was used there, if any. Um, and there are I haven't honestly checked in the past year or so, but um, th there are, well, yes, I have. There, there were seven studies in humans on the anti-diabetic activity. I think they're more like 10 now, and there are a number in progress um, showing lowered blood glucose with Moringa. Um, um, so a number of those studies, frankly, were sort of cruddy. They didn't have placebos, et cetera. But Quite, quite, um, quite striking, uh, and and the evidence is coming on fast. Next, please. This is just a quick overview, and we're not going to go into them. Promise. 
um, of the registered clinical trials that are um, that are using moringa um, leaves or leaf powder. Of, at the top, you see a lot of miscellaneous. Um, so I've got six diabetes and metabolic syndrome listed. Dental health has been getting a lot of attention. Breastfeeding. Um, Moringa is is considered a galactagogue uh, and, or a lactation enhancer. And there are very good studies and a huge amount of, of anecdotal evidence from breastfeeding mothers, but the, but the the scientific published scientific studies showing that um, milk volume can be uh, or is increased quite substantially um, in in cases where moringa is uh, where the mother is 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 taking moringa. Um, obviously, a, a a very healthy mother who's not having any problems expressing milk is going to see a less dramatic effect of moringa than than uh than someone who's who's been having problems or or is experiencing some some uh malnutrition um but this is this has been striking in the literature it doesn't get that much attention but it should we talked about malnutrition and you know on down the list being looked at for hiv in the clinic in people real people it's being looked at for its effect on the microbiome and then a few, a few uh, sort of one-off studies, which you know, we'll see what happens. Next, um, let's yeah, this is sort of redundant, I think. Let's pass on this. Yeah, let me. I'd like to stop talking a few minutes um, and listen to someone uh, a little bit more melodious. Lisa, <laughs> you're going to tell us about moringa I don't know about here, that. Right? <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Jed. Um, it's always very cool to, I feel like I know so much about Moringa, but I learn every time you talk. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of folks always ask, like, what do you look for in Moringa? And, um, you know, how do you judge your Moringa quality? And, you know, regardless of where you're buying it from, uh, I think it is important to just know what to look for. Um, color being a really easy one. So if the color is green, you know that it has, still has all the phytonutrients. Um, the other thing that's really important with Moringa is that there are a lot of microbiological activity that happens in Moringa. Um, and so making sure that, you know, the Moringa has been tested, that there's not high micros. Um, heavy metals is another thing, uh, just in terms of where Moringa is grown. It, it is a bioaccumulator. It sucks everything in the soil up into the leaves. Um, and then pesticide residue is a big one since it's, uh, it, you might have seen if you're following at all, there's kind of a big crackdown out of Moringa from India recently. The EU actually banned all Moringa coming out of India um, because there was a lot of brands that were claiming to be organic weren't actually organic. This is one of the reasons that Kuli Kuli sources primarily from Africa. Um, and we do test all of our Moringa to make sure it is actually organic um, and then responsible sourcing. You know, we are a B Corp responsible sourcing is very near and dear to our heart and I think is very important across all product lines. Um, so a little bit of kind of how we think about Moringa quality. Um, similar to matcha, there are different grades of Moringa. So, you know, D fails the test. Um, B is kind of in the middle. And then A grade is really that bright green Moringa um, that doesn't have any off flavors and has kind of this fresh grassy flavor. So from our standpoint, you know, we use third party, we've seen done a lot of third party studies showing that we have the cleanest and the healthiest Moringa on the market. Um, and one of the ways that we do that is sourcing directly from small farmers. So this is one of our farmers uh, who is in Uganda, the solar powered farm in Northern Uganda. You can see there's you know, no, no heavy metals, no heavy industry anywhere around. Um, no increases quality of our moringa also increases the impact. Um, so just briefly, Chef AJ said, you know, how do you use moringa? What does it taste like? Um, we've got a lot of different products. Uh, so from the pure moringa powder to energy shakes, gummies, blends, and bars. Um, and our, we are a B Corp, like I said, and really a mission-driven brand. I started with it out of the Peace Corps really this mission to nourish people on the planet through energizing, nutritious, and climate-smart crops. 
starting with Moringa, where we now have some other cool crops that we've added into the mix as well. Um, so this is kind of our flagship product, pure Moringa powder, bursting with vitamins and bioactives. Um, this is something you add in your smoothies, add in your lattes, and great for a lot of other things as well. Um, during COVID, it was really interesting. We saw a lot of new consumers into this wellness space. I think, you know, when we didn't have a vaccine, people were really just like, what can I take that will give me more immunity that will, you know, help my body build resilience. Um, and we've now seen a lot of those folks stay. And I think one of the things that I find the most interesting is there's a lot of consumers who walk down the supplement aisle and they look at all the products and you're like, what is this? What is the superfood? What do I do? Um, and so one of the things that we designed over the past year and a half was really a way to make superfoods super accessible and also delicious. So um, that's where we introduced gummies and blends. Um, so gummies, you know, delicious way to get your superfoods. The cool thing about these is um, there's no artificial anything, no added vitamins, no added, you know, flavors. It's all natural, real superfoods, and you're getting 300 to 400 milligrams of really bioactive ingredients. Um, and then in our gummies, we've looked at, you know, what are some other incredible superfoods like baobab, like hibiscus that um, pair well with Moringa, and are, we could also sustainably source from some of the same farming groups. So um, that's where we have Mood Magic, great for, you know, kind of an afternoon tangy tea, gut bliss. I take every morning my yogurt gives a nice tang, um, really helps with gut health. And then the green power, if you're wanting Moringa plus some other greens, including broccoli, um, we've got some, some great ones in there. So our products have gone a long way from when I dreamed this up in Peace Corps. We're now in 11,000 stores across the U.S. Um, and culinary tips. I think, you know, this is where Chef AJ would love your questions. I'll give you kind of my initial thoughts and thoughts from some of the chefs that we've worked with. Um, but in general, I'd say Moringa pairs really well with creamy, nutty flavors. I really love Moringa in the morning with some cinnamon um, and some nut butter in my oatmeal and makes a uh, really nice kind of like green oatmeal, sort of fun. My toddler actually, believe it or not, really likes it. Um, and in addition to brown flavors and, and nutty flavors, spicy flavors also do really well. So a lot of West Africa, you'll find kind of a Moringa chili dish. Um, and then citrus as well. So you can even make like a Moringa lemonade. I mean, I really like just Moringa, some lemon juice, mix it in. You could use that cold tea and maybe add a bit of lemon to spice it up that Jen mentioned earlier. Um, so we are, are big into lattes and there's a, a lot of different ways to do that. Um, you can just spice it up with a little bit of agave. You can add it to turmeric, kind of around um, inflammation and even mix. I really love the butterfly pea flower. It's a great way to use Moringa as well. Um, here's the, the lemonade I mentioned earlier. Um, if you want to get creative, um, kind of adding Moringa, some veggies to different products like called broccoli cheddar or cauliflower. Um, and this is actually uh, sort of inspired by one of the companies that we sell uh, products to that uses it in their baked goods. Um, you can also make pasta if you're feeling extra creative. Green pasta, always fun. Um, ramen as well and noodles and, you know, have a, a full serving of vegetables from the Moringa in the noodle itself, which is pretty incredible. Um, bread, tortillas, salty snacks. Yeah. Throw you a second. Yeah, the pasta and the ramen, are there any companies that are actually making and selling it now? Because I actually have made pasta, but it's, you know, it's sort of rare. It's um, not something that many people do that often. Yeah, there are not any companies that I know of yet. Well, no, that's not true. Lotus Foods had a Moringa ramen. I think they still have it. Um, so that one I've seen, I haven't seen like a thick pasta with Moringa. Well, I guess I'll have to break out the pasta machine and keep making Break it. out the pasta machine, yeah. <laughs> um, another one, I really like Moringa dill popcorn, adding you know, Moringa, some dill, some salt, garlic powder, um, makes amazing popcorn um, soup. This is a Filipino soup that's a big traditional soup. You can also add it to miso soup. I love making that. Um, and then, you know, Again, similarly, other Asian-inspired soups. 
pesto ice cream moringa matcha cookies are really delicious um, and even there's some skincare uses as well. It is really rich in antioxidants and moisturizing agents. Um, so I linked out to some of the different face masks that some folks have made. Um, but there's a lot of cool stuff there as well. And I'll stop there because I want to make sure we have lots of time for discussion and just say, you know, I started this coming out of the Peace Corps. We continue to have that ethos of sourcing from small farmers. We've put over $6 million directly in the hands of small million, small farmers. Um, we support about 3,000 farmers through our network and our supply chain. Um, we offset a lot of carbon and all of our products are made in um, upcycled plastic. So it's uh, basically, it's using recycled plastic to make new pouches, which diverts a lot of plastic water bottles. So trying to make sure that we are doing right by the planet. Chef AJ, come back. All right. I know I was here the whole time. No, actually, I just I took a walk and it, no. so, no. you know, now that I think about it, I wish you had sent me some and I could have tasted it on the air or tried it because yeah, I'm pretty good at figuring out how to use things in recipes. So the thing is, is you don't want to heat it though, if I understand you correctly, it loses some properties. Well, yeah, Jed, you want to answer that? Yeah, I mean, it loses it loses some, but but again, um, so that yeah, it's complicated. I almost wish I hadn't shown that slide, but, but that was <laughs> but you that did, was a, <laughs> but I did. So that was a cell culture test. So in the cell culture, we did not add the gut microflora back into those cultures. So it, um, it, 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 our our goal in that study was just to sort of isolate that particular compound and show that it was uh, effective in the antioxidant ac uh, assay. When you eat any of these cruciferous vegetables, be they cooked or raw, you do have everyone, I mean, literally everyone, unless someone's had a, a major gastrointestinal surgery and antibiotics, has the, that microflora, those bugs, those bacteria in their guts that do the conversion. So I would say it doesn't matter whether it's cooked or raw. Uh, from a from a nutritional perspective, absolutely doesn't matter. From a phytochemical perspective, yeah, you shift the 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 relative abundance of one to the other. Um, but uh, Jim, AJ, I will both. definitely send you some product to try <laughs> after this. My and, apologies for not asking. Oh no, that's me. okay. I was just thinking it'd be a good idea, and I'm pretty honest about you know things, and you'll know by my face how how often do you recommend somebody use this if they like it, and if they don't like it, should they still use it anyway? <laughs> um. Well, you know, I would say one of the things that's really interesting, and there's actually a New York Times article about this a few years ago, is just how plants have evolved to sort of ward off, you know, bad bugs for this is the non science version. Um, and in doing that, they have these kind of like bitter or spicy notes. Um, but those same bitter or spicy notes are often the things that are really good for us to eat because they help ward up off bad bugs <laughs> inside of us. Um, so if you think of like arugula, if you think of kale, if you think of, you know, so many of the cruciferous vegetables, um, they all have a little bit of, of bitterness and spiciness. And, and that is something that is really good for you. It's also something that your taste buds get used to over time. Um, I know that uh, I think I, I watched in, in your, your video of one of the conferences that you spoke at telling your story of you know, um, they didn't give kale on the first day of this wellness conference. They gave it on the third day, kind of working up to it. Um, but I think similarly with Moringa, if you don't like it the first time you try it, I would encourage you to just try a small amount and, and kind of work up to a larger amount because it, it really does grow on you um, and it, it, it does get better over time. And I'll, I'll let Jed answer how much Moringa should you consume. Well, I, th I think you're answer is spot on. I, I mean, should you force yourself to eat it? Is it an essential food? I mean, if you really don't like it after trying what Lisa suggested, is it an essential food? No, no. Can you can you do without it? Of course. But um, it is good for you. It is healthy. And, and uh, it does have some of these medicinal properties. Um, in terms of quantity, um, it, it is a little difficult to say. 
Um, in term, because as as you know, Chef AJ, you know when you talk about people eating things like broccoli, fresh broccoli or kale, um, there's a self limitation to how much people will eat or can eat. You eat two or three servings of either of those things in a meal, um, and you're gonna stop. It's just uh, you've had enough. The same thing applies for fresh moringa leaves. Well. It's a tropical crop and we can't get fresh moringa leaves in this country that are worth eating. Um, and so uh, in the places where it grows, the same thing applies, two or three servings a day. When you, it is sort of enough, I would say. And when you boil it down, when you not boil it down, when you dry it down to a leaf powder, then the question is more what is, you know, what is the equivalent of two or three servings a day? So just doing a little fast math, if 60, 60 grams of fresh leaves is a, is, or a cup full is considered a serving and you dry it, it's what, 90% water, Lisa? So something like six grams maybe is one serving. Does that sound sort of about six to 10 grams maybe? Uh, one serving of, of moringa? Of dried powder, yeah. Of dried powder. Yeah, we generally recommend people start with like, a heaping tablespoon, just about two and a half grams, um, mm -hmm. and then kind of work up from there. So you so, got a two-sided essay on that, but is that is that no, helpful? <laughs> no, no, that's great. And you know, okay. you mentioned like it gave, it gave when you were taking it in the Peace Corps, like it gave you energy. Maybe like I feel like maybe similar to a cup of coffee. So what I'm curious if somebody is sensitive to caffeine and coffee, like me, would it do the same thing? Because I don't like the feeling of caffeine. It makes you know I'm it just doesn't yeah. agree with me. So is marine? Would it do the same so, thing? You know, make my heart go race, make me anxious, like no. the coffee does. Yes. Um, and that's a really good question. I'm really glad you asked that. I don't drink coffee either. I think I'm like a hyperactive person to begin with and coffee just like, yeah, sends me over the edge. Um, not, not doesn't do good for me. And actually a lot of our customers are also very caffeine sensitive. And I think that's one of the things that folks like, like about Moringa is that it's energy from the vitamins, from the nutrients. It's not a stimulant. There's no caffeine and it doesn't, it, it's kind of like just a gentle lift. Right. So I'm curious, like, because I, I, you know, I'd love to try it now, but I'm curious, you know, like sometimes people that don't even drink coffee, like maybe they're doing this road trip and they got it, you know, they got to stay awake. So they, they, they go and have that cup of coffee to get the caffeine. Could, could that be used in, I'm, I mean, not that I'd ever be driving some, but I'm just trying to think like, my, when would I use it? A lot of folks do it um, in the morning uh, as kind of like a, you know, get, get started on the day. And then I also know a lot of coffee drinkers who do it as their kind of like late afternoon latte, you know, at that three o'clock, four o'clock time of day when you don't actually want to drink coffee, but you need just a little bit of boost to get you through the rest That's of the day. That's what I was thinking, because could people that, because, you know, there are a few doctors, even plant-based doctors that are really in love with coffee, but most of them that I have on the show are not really fans of coffee and I'm curious if it could help somebody that's trying to get off coffee or caffeine, if that's, this could be a good substitute for them. Yeah, we've, we've, uh, we actually ran a challenge a few years ago of hardcore coffee drinkers trying Moringa instead every day. And we, we did convert some folks. I wouldn't, I won't lie and say we converted everyone, um, but there were some folks who tried it who said that they could, they could switch to this. That's interesting. You have this beautiful screen behind you, but could you actually show the product, you know, like, like hold it up or can you get it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I realize it is sitting just yeah, a couple feet away from me. Go get it. So, I'll talk to Dr. Faye. Let me, let well, me uh, what, turn, yeah, talk yeah, to well, Dr. She, Faye for a moment. Well, she, well, she gets it. Um, yeah, I also don't drink coffee, um, although I have been a coffee addict at some points in my life, but for the last three years I haven't. Um, but um, I would say if so, this has nothing to do with nutrition or with what you, but what, with what you asked, if you're on a long road trip and you need a caffeine boost and don't want the caffeine, I'd say pull the hell over, slap yourself in the face, do some jumping jacks. Um, yeah. 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 Don't I don't know. Driving. I know that's, 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 yeah. that's Hey, so uh, yeah. you can answer this question, Dr. Faye, yeah, yeah. not uh, Lisa, when she comes back, it's from Ursula. Yeah. Should moringa come from Africa or is there a best place for it to come from? Because I've also seen some come from Mexico. 
Yeah, that that's a great question, and and uh, the the short answer to that is it should come from any place in the tropics where it's safely sourced, and and Lisa I think addressed that a little bit, talking about some of the the heavy metal hazards and pesticide hazards from moringa coming from India, and she sources from from Africa primarily, um, but um, it, it, this it grows throughout the tropics, throughout the world. So it grows in the Caribbean, it grows in, in as you say, Mexico, Central America, um, it, uh, the Philippines, Indonesia, you know, all, all over South and Southeast Asia. So I think the question is more, is it responsibly sourced? And, and as Lisa said, they deal directly with small farmers. It's not grown on plantations. Um, you know they they have a social mission in doing that and they but they also have a safety mission and a traceability mission in doing that um so yes it, it is uh, your your caller said you know she's seen it from mexico certainly it it can come from mexico or any of uh, a, a large number of places in the tropics um lisa the question was about about yeah, um, I, I still have my hair pods in. Yeah, so I, could, okay. I could hear it. You did a good, that was perfect yeah. answer. That's that's how I would answer it um, too. And I would say, you know, Kulukui does source all over the world. About 60% of our Moringa comes from the African continent, but we do get some Moringa from Mexico and from a few other places. And um, to me, it's really about quality, um, quality and, you know, community impact as well, um, rather than, you know, so we're not, we're not tied to one certain geography. Mm -hmm. Can we add one one other oh, thing, and that and uh, one other thing, and that's the drying. I mean, someone who's trying to quickly turn around a bunch of moringa and and get it on the market and make a quick buck may very well put it in a in a in a dryer that just f basically fries it. And I think some of the more responsibly sourced moringa is is shade dried under a shade cloth or or dried with gentle heating. Um, which is not necessarily amenable to really high throughput on a plantation sort of system. Um, so anyway, sorry, you've got product to show. Oh yeah, let's see, Lisa, what you have. Yeah, so this is the pure moringa powder. Um, I'm gonna even see if I can open it up. You can kind of see lots of beautiful green powder in there. It does um, kind of look like matcha, the same color. Yeah, right? it does. And, you know, I wish you could smell it through here, but it's kind of like a grassy sort of like, uh, some people say it smells like hay, um, but that's some earthy flavor. Earthy so is, is is that the Cooley Cooley powder? Because Linda, who's watching live, says she uses two teaspoons a day. I'd love to know how you lose, use it in the chat, Linda. Um, yeah. Yeah. This is, this is the Cooley Cooley Marina powder. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't show another brand. That would be kind of weird. I know. Um, but she called, that's what she called it. She said. She yeah. It. Yeah. Oh. This is our flagship product. So this is the product that you can find everywhere from like Whole Foods to Sprouts to Walmart, you know, occasionally even in Costco. Um, and of course online, you know, on our own website and on Amazon. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is the one that I definitely recommend you know purest form of moringa so if you're really looking for like a medicinal potent dose um this is a good place to start i think if you are like so many people are today interested in gut health um this is our gut bliss so this combines some superfoods that i really love um i can open it if you want to see it too um so combines moringa with baobab have you ever heard of baobab chef aj what'd you say Baobab. I haven't heard that. No. So that's another really cool product. Um, it's a fruit of a tree that produces this really amazing powder. It's really high in prebiotic fiber. Um, and as Jed said, Moringa is also great for gut health. And so we mix those two together. Um, you know, some ginger, some lemon balm, some lucuma. You can see it's kind of like a little bit of a lighter green. Um, and it uh, the taste is a little more gingery, but it's really nice with yogurt. Um, that's often how I will use it. Just spilled green powder all over my computer, but it's fine. Um, <laughs> and then the other <laughs> products that I think are, are worth just showing, um, this is actually the best-selling gummy at Whole Foods right now. We're really excited about that. Um, this is our green gummy. 
So you're getting moringa and you're getting eleven super greens. I can't say. Oh, what, what, just um, what's what's in it? So you are getting wheatgrass, morella, spinach, kale, moringa. Um, I feel like I'm going to blank out on a couple. <laughs> um, alfalfa, barley grass, um, all just really incredible grains blend. And it's made with, you know, you're getting 400 milligrams of grains, which is why this is like kind of bigger than most gummies because we're sweet- cramming a lot in there. What did it taste like? Do you sweeten it? And will you taste one right now so we can see if it's good? Oh, of course. <laughs> They're delicious. Like hands down the, the best greens gummy you will ever buy. Um, I will send them to you. Please go but, live at some point and tell people if I'm lying. If okay. you hate it, I will be shocked. They don't have sugar or anything in them, right? There is a little bit of sugar to hold the gummy oh. together. It's two grams. Hmm. So when you say barley grass, if somebody is 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 gluten free, does that is, can they have that? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, technically, I think it's actually the the wheat grass and the barley grass. I mean, that if you are super sensitive, um, I wouldn't recommend this one. We do have some other gummies as well that do not have any gluten traces. Um, this is our Moringa and turmeric one. Deb talked about the anti-inflammatory benefits of Moringa. Obviously, everyone knows the anti-inflammatory benefits of turmeric. When combined, they're pretty powerful. You can see it's like a little yellowish. Um, There's no so. way you can get out of using the sugar, though. I've had my audience not crazy about any amount of sugar. Nothing you could have used, huh? Yeah, I think that the challenge in making a gummy is you need something to hold it together. What about fruit juice? I've seen gummies made with apple juice. Back then, yeah. Yeah, um, we have tried. We have tried really hard, and it hasn't held together because we cram so much powder into it. Um, because we're using, we're not using extracts. We're using the whole plant. So nice. I think hopefully down the line we will. Um, but All we've right. tried to make them kind of as real food as possible. So it's nice. Yeah. Um, Adeline says, "How long of a shelf life does the powder have?" Powder is a three-year shelf life. Um, I tend to recommend that if you are sort of a purist like me, I would say once you open it, keeping it in the fridge keeps it tasting the freshest. Um, but it doesn't have to be. You can keep it on the shelf for you know three years and it'd be fine. Oh. And one another viewer, JJ says uh, they put two teaspoons in water and drink it. Hasn't tried it on food. So that's cool if somebody can just drink it and in water like that so it must not taste yeah good. it is yeah. it is a strong flavor so you know hats hats off to you my friend it is it is going to be green you can imagine like powdered kale mixed into water it's, it's green and, um, and but some jennifer people love says, that jennifer confirms you want to keep it in the refrigerator once you open it yeah the thing about uh, putting yeah. thing about Go putting ahead. it in water is it does have t- it doesn't dissolve i mean it disperses but it's still there it's still particulate right so So I'd be more worried about texture than taste when you put it in water, just water. Interesting. So if you want it to really dissolve, you're thinking like a smoothie would be best blending it. Yeah, smoothies are good. Yogurt's good. Oatmeal's good. Making it into a latte. So you can, um, if you mix it into like a plant-based milk with a frother, that works really well. And somebody's asking about the amount of iron in it. Yeah. Chad, do you want to take that one? You want me to? It's very high in iron. But you, you've you got the numbers in front of you, Lisa. I don't actually. Yes, yeah, so it's it's quite high in iron. Um, and it's also high in vitamin C to help your body absorb the iron. Um, you know, gram per gram, it, it does compare very well to even uh, proteins in meat and some of the iron in meat. Um depends on how much you're taking you know I would say when you're starting with kind of a smaller amount like at a teaspoon you're not getting a huge amount of iron but when you're getting up to you know five or ten grams of iron you can get 20 percent of your iron for the day and in the 10 grams of moringa nice and somebody's asking is there any oil in the gummies we do not use any oil no Nice. And somebody's asking, um, what's the name? What was the food like in Africa? Yeah. Africa. 
Yeah. Yeah. So the name, a lot of people are like, where does the name Cooley Cooley come from? So it comes from this uh, popular peanut snack. And in the village I was working in, they would mix it with moringa leaves and they'd actually add some great spices, a little bit of chili um, and mix it all together into the snack. And that's what I started eating every day that I was like, oh my gosh, this makes me feel amazing. Nice. Uh, here's a funny question from Pat. Can you give it to a dog? <laughs> Why would you want your dog to have? Uh, no, it's a good question. Um, uh, it's it's interesting. So you see this, and Doug can speak to the science, but we see this all over, um, you know, the tropics. A lot of folks will feed moringa to their cattle. They'll feed it to their goats, and it really does help with animal health. And we actually coolie coolie sells our moringa powder to some pet food companies. So there are. There is dog food on the market made with moringa, and they've actually done some studies and found that it it really does help the dogs but, but that do if you know like, anything about the research yeah do they like yeah, the great, taste though does the dog great, like the taste that's a great question and one of the one some of the research that's been done on on animal feeding shows show, shows some really great responses to moringa i think pigs and this is in central america pigs tilapia in aquaculture so fish um and uh as you say, as you say, goats and certainly, certainly pets and, and snacks and pet food. Yeah. yeah to your question, cool. Chef AJ, uh, you know, you don't have, it's not, I would say the dogs probably don't even taste it when you mix it up with a bunch of other stuff. That's interesting. How long have you run the company, Lisa? When did you found it? Yeah. So I started the company in 2014. So we're coming up on our 10 year anniversary. It's been a, a wild ride. You look very young to be such an entrepreneur. Was it hard to get it to market? It's been a labor of love. Um, yeah, I mean, I think when I, so I was, you know, 25 when I launched it. And um, a lot of people were like, what are you doing? You're going to source, you know, this plant nobody's ever heard of. You're going to source it from small farmers in Africa, you know. How are you going to get it here? We can't get quality ingredients out of Africa. There's just a lot of reasons that people thought it wasn't going to work. Um, but I was really passionate about it. And I think my passion came from from two places. One from like, this plant is amazing and needs to be everywhere. It can benefit so many Americans. And on the flip side, you know, really trying to uphold the promise I made to the women I was working with in West Africa of helping them access the U.S. market in a way that could really help improve their livelihood. That's great. You know, I, I don't go to Jamba Juice, but my husband does. I don't know why, because I can make him a good, cheaper smoothie at home. But I do remember when I went there, gosh, it's been over 20 years, they used to offer like a, a boost, they call it a boost with their uh, smoothies. And one of them they called energy. I'm wondering, would that, do you think it's Moringa? What do you think is in their energy boost? Because it sounds like that would be a good boost if they don't sell it. Yeah. I'm not sure. We actually, we were in discussions with Jamba Juice, like kind of pre-COVID and then things fell apart, but they have been very interested in Moringa. So I don't think they currently offer it, but I think they should. That's so interesting. Um, Nancy says, should she worry if her powder is from India, but if it's organic from India? Yeah. I mean, I, I think the thing that I would want to look at is, is just, like, is it a company that is reputable, preferably a company that is in retail? Because, you know, re certain retailers like Whole Foods and others will require testing. Um, the problem with just kind of buying whatever, you know, Moringa powder you find on the internet is is often they can label it as organic, but it, it contains traces of pesticides. Um, it's a little bit of a wild, wild west, particularly on Amazon. Great. Thank you. How did you guys hook up together? I mean, not to, I didn't mean it like that. Like, yeah, yeah. No, that okay. did not sound very, <laughs> how'd you guys hook up? Um, so I actually, so when I came back from the Peace Corps, like Jen mentioned, I was trying to get into Whole Foods and they were requesting a lot of different documentation about, you know, why is Moringa safe for human health? Um, how do we know that this is like a high quality product? And, you know, I came to Jed, cold emailed him and said, you know, I'm, I'm former Peace Corps volunteer. I'm trying to help some of the women I was working with in West Africa sell Moringa here in the U.S. We've got a really high quality product. We just need to prove it to Whole Foods. You know, can you help me put together some of the documentation? And Jed was unbelievably kind, um, especially to a total stranger and said, yeah, you know, I'm, 
I'm passionate about Moringa and I, I like what you're doing and I'll, I'll help you. That's great. Well, thank you. Yeah, we've been we've been yeah. friends for a decade. Wow. But you live on opposite coasts. Have you met in person? Oh yeah. In uh, fact, a couple times. Yeah. In fact, I have to tell you when I talked to you the other day, Lisa, I forgot to tell you. Please tell your mom and dad and sister I said hi. So yeah, we've we've all met. I've stayed at her parents' house. In fact, so <laughs> my my yeah. dad is also a professor, and so I feel like he and Jed really bonded in that professorial way. Oh, good. Well, I will pay attention now. You know, I mean, I'm sure this is something that's been in the store. I just, it's never been on my radar. So I'll definitely look into it. And thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for having us. And I will make sure that you, I send you some products and Chef AJ, if you wanted to send a, a discount code to share with your listeners, I'd be happy to provide one of those as well. If you could provide it ASAP, I can get it in what's called the show notes. That would be amazing because then um, that, that would be so cool. So if, the sooner you can do that, I can just add it to the show notes. I will I make it right after this. Enter Chef AJ at coolypoolyfoods.com, 20% off your whole order. Oh, my God. Thank you. That's very kind of you. That's wonderful. I hope people will then have the incentive to try it if it sounds interesting to them. All right. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Thank Lisa. Nice, nice to meet you. And nice to see you again, Dr. Fahey. Nice. Same here. And thanks Good all of you. Right, great. Thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 9 a.m. for the plant-based kitchen. I can't speak today. The plant-based kitchen, Lisa. Chef Kelly Williamson making ratatouille.